San Diegans accomplish great things every day. We care about our neighbors and our community. We are proud of our diversity. We are resilient. We hold our leaders accountable. We live in one of the most dynamic cities in America. The San Diego Union Tribune, telling San Diego's story for more than 150 years. Hello, I'm Dr. Gail F. Baker, Vice President and Provost at the University of San Diego. And I'm Dr. Noelle Norton, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at USD. For the second year in a row, USD, along with its College of Arts and Sciences and Humanities Center, is proud to return as the presenting sponsor for the 2021 San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books. As a university deeply committed to the liberal arts, USD promotes a form of lifelong learning that ignites curiosity, builds critical connections across different ideas and topics by seeing them from unique perspectives. Our partnership with the Festival of Books enables all of us avid readers to come together as a community alongside renowned authors from all over the world and to dive deeply into imaginative stories and important themes. Yes, books do have the ability to open minds and hearts. On behalf of the University of San Diego, we thank you for joining us for today's program to explore the world of books with us. Enjoy the presentation. Hi everyone, welcome to the San Diego Union Tribune Festival of Books. My name is Isabel Yap, I am an author. My latest collection, uh, Never Have I Ever, came out from Small Beer Press earlier this year. And I'm so excited to be here with Cadwell Turnbull and Rika Aoki. Cadwell is the author of um, No Gods, No Monsters, uh, and Rika is the author of Light from Uncommon Stars. So we're gonna talk today uh, about you know, their forthcoming books, uh, writing across genres, writing multiple POVs, and lots of cool stuff. Um, I did want to start off by letting them introduce themselves. So Cadwell, maybe you could, um, yeah, talk to the audience. Um, hi, I'm Cadwell Turnbull, author of The Lesson and the Upcoming No Gods, No Monsters. Um, I also write short fiction. My short fiction has appeared in um, magazines like The Verge, Lightspeed, Nightmare, Asimov Science Fiction, and some anthologies like The Year's Best Science Fiction and Fantasy and The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. Um, and I teach creative writing at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Awesome. Rika? Hi, I'm Rika Aoki, and I'm a poet and a novelist. I also do some musician things, and I also teach self-defense. Uh, I'm a black belt. But in any case, this is my latest book, and it's called Light from Uncommon Stars. And if I read, you know, from the back, it's a defiantly joyful speculative adventure. So here's to that. Um, <laughs> I, and reading my own bio, uh, I'm also the publisher. I mean, I'm also the writer of Himalia Hilo. I'm a two-time Lambda Literary Award finalist, and my work's been you know, featured or been recognized in Vogue, Elle, Bustle, Pop Sugar, Buzz, Buzzfeed, a few other things. Um, my poetry was last uh, shown at the Asian American Smithsonian, uh, in the Asian Pacific American uh, Smith, at the Smithsonian, rather, as part of their uh, part of their exhibit, and I have an MFA from Cornell, and I'm a professor at Santa Monica College, where I teach English and critical thinking and a few other things that they let me do. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, love talking to teachers, too, because you usually have good advice for writing students. <laughs> um, I did want to start out, actually, by asking about these forthcoming books. Um, so what was the seed for each story? Um, and why was this the story that you wanted to write next? So maybe Rika, we'll start with you. Mm, well, the scene was pretty simple. Um, there's actually one incident that happened that made me think, yeah, this is, this is what I gotta do. Um, I was coming, out, coming home from a reading uh, performance and I was flying into LAX, uh, into Los Angeles International Airport at night and uh, you fly into LAX at night. If, if the weather's right and you're lucky, the plane will bank. And for a split second, you don't know if you're looking up or down. Because what ends up happening is you're looking into the city, but there's all of these lights. And you're thinking, 
looks like I'm going up into some sort of galactic empire, you know, sort of thing, because you've got all of these starships going along in places. And I just thought, LA is way too magical not to write about. And um, then I came home and I picked up my car from remote parking and I'm driving home in my little Honda and I'm still on this, um, this sort of space vibe. And I drive past, uh, another thing Los Angeles is really known for is donuts. And when you come home on, uh, when you drive north on La Cienega Boulevard, coming home from the airport, there's this giant donut lit, uh, lit up and it's Randy's Donuts. It's an LA landmark. If you're ever in LA, Randy's Donuts, stop on your way to the airport because it's amazing. And there it was, lit and I'm already thinking I'm in my little spaceship and I was looking at that donut and I'm going wow that's that's like a beacon what if that were a stargate and you know um spaceships and you know and and, and I went on from there and I don't want to go too much more into it you know because um that would give the book away but um I wanted to write something very spacey uh, that put me in the mood, but mm -hmm. also I didn't forget coming into Los Angeles and I wanted to make sure that the people that I wrote about were the people I grew up with. I just thought, you know, mm -hmm. not everybody has to look like the crew of all of next generation. You know, we can, we can have people who are queer. We can have, can have, you know, more than one Asian in the cast, you know, we can have, you know, it's like, um, I have this one thing where, you know, I want it instead of like, you know, in Star Trek, Dr. McCoy heals people, you know, people with a salt shaker. I wanted to make that a show you bottle, a soy sauce bottle. And I just wanted to give the people I grew up with and in my neighborhood, um, the stars. Love that. Yeah. I felt so much of how lovingly you rendered the setting in the book. Um, and I I felt probably setting was a big driver for this story, but I have not tried the donut. Um, and my sister lives in LA, so next time I visit her. Next time, you can either go to Randy's Donut and also Kindle Donut. Those are the two giant donut places. Okay. But, but, but they're literally, they're worth it. Los Angeles is much more of a donut town than people think it is. It's, it's not really about the beaches. It's about the donuts. Got it. The beaches yeah. are in San Diego, but we got the better donuts. Sorry, <laughs> San Diego. I've just insulted the entire festival. <laughs> um, man, I, yeah, I don't associate LA with donuts. So definitely going to try to change that association. Um, Cattle, how about for you? Oh, well, I, oh man, I don't have such a like, you know, visual description of how it happened, but you know, I grew up, you know, really into um, urban fantasy as a genre. My, some of my favorite TV shows were um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, Charmed. I used to just watch Charmed reruns all the time. Um, and, um, you know, just recently, within the last few years, I've been, you know, reading a lot of um, urban fantasy books with my wife. And um, I just, the, the thought occurred to me, I'd, I'd never written in a genre. I loved all of these genre tropes. I love vampires and werewolves and, and witches and all this stuff. And I was like, could I write in the genre? Maybe, you know, maybe I could do this. And um, I decided to, you know, try, I, I guess what's, well, how it happened was I just started thinking about what kind of monsters and creatures and preternatural creatures I would want to write about. Some of them, you know, that immediately came to mind was um, some Caribbean monsters that I grew up with, things like the Wu-Wu, which is like a like a Caribbean like werewolf, and um, the Sukuyant, which is like, um, you know, I describe it as a mix between like a vampire and a selkie. It's like they remove their skin and they they suck blood, and you know, in you know the way that I envision them is when they remove their skin, they're invisible and they have like, um, you know the way I visualize the Sukuyant is, you know, it has like a tongue that unlatches from its mouth and like, you know, kind of stings people like a mosquito. <laughs> and so, you know, um, as I started thinking about, okay, what kind of monsters I would populate in this world, then I started thinking about what the story might be. And I, you know, I'm very interested in social organization, like how, how groups of people come together, how communities come together um, to, to create stability for themselves. I'm into, 
cooperatives and other forms of solidarity economics. And, um, but I'm also interested in, you know, institutions of power and how those kinds of organizations and systems can create, um, you know, harm. And that, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, um, the book is centered around uh, an act of police brutality. And I always get frustrated when I'm, you know, reading discourse around that, where it's very narrowly focused on what happened in the frame. And for me, it's just as important thinking about how we get here and how this keeps happening. And I wanted to tell a story where you see it, you see a, um, a scene in the frame that you recognize and then it turns strange. And then you kind of like pull back layers and you find that it connects to all of this other stuff. And, you know, I feel like it's, is my way of trying to say we should look more broadly at how things happen. Um, mm -hmm. And so that became a big part of the story as well, trying to take this, you know, fun stuff and then, you know, marry it with something a, a little bit more serious and um, put some thought into how those things intersect. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the other part of it was, I've been kind of thinking for, it has been, I think it's been over a decade now, um, this cosmology of gods and demigods that has just been floating in the back of my head. And I just couldn't figure out a way to tell a story that would be interesting, mm -hmm. that would apply those parts of, um, you know, my, you know, all this creative energy I put into this kind of like, just people that's just walking around in my brain all the time. And so it was, um, I felt like, oh, well, you know, this story has witches and mages and all kinds of weird stuff. I could throw some gods in there. And that became like the final part of the, you know, the recipe. There's some other stuff in there, but that's the that's the gist. Yeah, oh, I yeah. want to read that book soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Really? Um, okay. Okay. I and I think um, that's kind of a good segue into the next question I was going to ask, which is, both of your books have a pretty large cast of characters, some of whom are not human. Um, so I was kind of interested in you know when you're creating. Um, stories where there are multiple viewpoints uh, and the story jumps pretty quickly between them. Like, how do you think about this cast of characters? Uh, I'm kind of curious who you started with, actually, if it's not spoilery. Um, and also, how do you tackle characters that are maybe very different than you? So not necessarily because they're a monster or because they're an alien, but just like someone who totally doesn't think the way you typically do. Um, and yeah, Cadwell, maybe we'll start with you this time. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. So, you know, I I think I think I started with this with Lena. Um, Lena, she's the she's the sister of um, the, the 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 guy that is the victim of you know this you know you know shooting, and um, you know I started with that scene, imagining what that scene might look like, and then thinking about what what her relationship would be to her brother. It's, um, it's her brother who has been estranged. She's been estranged from her brother for a really long time because of something that happened in the past um, and some things that he's been, you know, caught up in in his own personal life. And just thinking about um, how that how that plays out between family members, you know, I something that is, you know, I've experienced in my own life is people struggling with addiction and I, that, became like a big part of the story. And, you know, Lena is is really close to um, to that with her brother. She's seen it happen over his lifetime, him, um, you know, dealing with substance abuse. And it, um, you know, she feels a certain level of responsibility. So that, that relationship was the first thing that I started with. And then mm -hmm. from there, um, and it, I just, this is how my brain works. I just get interested in other things happening in the frame. So, um, mm -hmm. You know, Lena has has a husband, and um, he's really interesting. And so I started thinking a lot about well, you know what's going on with the husband, and then you know um, um, he's a part of a you know a, you know collective that does activist work. And I started thinking about some other characters within that circle, and it just you know spread out and out and out from there. Um, and you know finding ways to think about all of these disparate characters and then bring them together is always a challenge. But you know that's something that I, I find that my brain can wrap around a lot better than you know telling a single protagonist story. I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know why. Um, maybe it's because I'm, I have ADHD, but it, you know I just it's really 
it's just really um, fun for me to like take a character over here um, and think about what kind of relationships this character might have to this other character. And because I'm so interested in like mm -hmm. communities and movements, it, it, you know, becomes like a big part of the project, like trying to figure out ways that all of these different people from different walks of life intersect and interact. Um, to answer the other part of the question is the thing that I start with is just imagining that, you know, this might seem, I don't know, productive or simple, but that the people that are different than me are also human beings. I try to, I, I give them a lot of parts to, and layers to themselves. You know, like I think that that's an important part of telling a story of someone that is unlike myself is giving them things beyond just what you would immediately notice. You know, like this person is a woman of color. They're also into wood carving, you know, they, mm -hmm. they like, um, you know, they, they're, they're an activist. They, they, they are interested in cooperatives. They listen to podcasts, um, you know, building out a character in interests and passions and history and all of that stuff is the way that I try to, you know, bring the human element to this other character that sees things in a, in a different light. And also, you know, I, I try to do my homework. I talk to people, you know, mm -hmm. when I was working on this book, I, you know, I just sat with people. I was like, can I talk to you about what the experience of, um, I have a character that's, you know, in the book that's trans and I talked to someone about the experience, you know, and, um, you know, someone that's non-binary, um, talk mm -hmm. to people about, you know, being in a relationship, in a, in a polyamorous relationship, what's that's like, you know, and, um, talk to a bee scientist about bees. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know, um, all of those things to try to help flesh out a character and make them feel like a whole person and not just, you know, representative of one thing, you know, multifaceted. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, the research, we, we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. Rico, how about for yourself? I find it really interesting that, you know, reading, writing science fiction or fantasy, it's ironic that you're doing this, but you're actually rooting very solidly in your heritage and in your neighborhood and in the people you know. I mean, and very overtly, uh, I have a friend and her name is Katrina. And mm -hmm. she, quite a few years back when uh, I was again on tour, she was really sad because, and she's this kind of a sensitive soul, really just a cinnamon roll. Um, she was saying that, you know, she was sad because every time she said her name, people said, oh, like the hurricane, ha, ha, ha. And oh. she felt like, oh, I don't want to be associated with people dying and losing and so many horrible things. So I said, at the time, I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to write a novel and I'm going to make the main character and I'm going to call and she's going to be named Katrina. So people will have something else to talk about when they mention this name. And mm -hmm. there we go. You know, the, um, uh, so Katrina was the first character I really fleshed out. Uh, she was the character I had to write. Um, mm -hmm. Now, beyond that, you know, these are mostly uh, people that I know in various walks of, mm. of life. Uh, you know, it's either some of them are alive, some of them are gone. Um, but um, I guess this also ties in, you know, my, a couple of reviewers have said they don't understand how an alien Vietnamese donut shop that came from outer space can meld with a bunch of violin people and curses with the devil and things like that. <laughs> um, but I think when you're a person of color, when you're Asian, when you're queer, and you're trying to make make it make a go out of it in in the United States, which is not all like you, you have to think that way. And you do combine a lot of different cultures. And sometimes you don't even know what you're transacting. And you're speaking in different languages. I'm speaking to my grandmother in a completely different language. And I'm speaking to... Um, you know, somebody I'm working with, maybe I'm sitting in an English department meeting. I, I'm in a, I'm in literally in one world with one set of magic and one set of rules. And then I go to Hawaii and suddenly I don't even speak this way anymore. And I'm in a mm. completely different world. And I think that um, one of the things that having marginalized voices writing speculative science fiction is, is it really... Um, it really shows alternate ways of telling a story. Um, I think for some 
readers, especially I think maybe some readers who are more marginalized, I think this is a very natural way to tell a story. You know, mm -hmm. I'm listening to Cadwell speak about, you know, the different things coming in, gods and this and spirits. I'm going, yeah, cool. I can't mm -hmm. wait. Suddenly some, this, this, this seems a lot closer to me than the hero leaving his hometown and everything he loves to go fight a dragon because that's mm -hmm. not the way we do things in Hawaii. We bring the family, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that there's a lot of things in, in books, especially books written by POC, people written by people, people come from islands, you know, where um, there are, where I think there's some really cool storytelling, you know, that's happening. It's not all Joseph Campbell. The hero doesn't have to leave the village to go to a journey, you know, to go on some sort of hero's journey. Mm -hmm. We we can all do we can do this together, you know, we can we can all be heroes. And um the other one too is how to what you're talking about, um how to identify with people, aliens and people who really aren't thinking like you. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. This is an easy one. I'm transgender. Everyone thinks different from me. Mm -hmm. And uh, if if I don't know, and if I can't make a good guess as to whether somebody's going to say, welcome, or get the hell out of my store, mm -hmm. I, I get in trouble. Um, I, I can get hurt. If I go into the wrong place, I can get hurt. If uh, If I don't go into the right place, I can lose a friend. So, um, I think that this kind of getting into people's minds, I think that uh, my experience and the experience of some of my trans sisters, you know, when we sit and we talk and the way we read people, um, mm -hmm. and not to judge, you know, a lot of times that's, uh, it gets misread. We're not judging, you know, to like, um, to give shade. We're judging because our lives depend on it. A right. lot of times we go on the wrong date. It ends very, very badly for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's how, and I used a lot of that sort of, um, that sort of skill that I acquired to, to write these characters. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, I really felt that reading the book and there were moments you know, Katrina felt like a character I could understand because I was like, I like video games, I like anime, like I know this person. And then there mm -hmm. were moments when Katrina's experience of the world just like really hit different. And the the teacher character um, also, right? Like she has these moments where she's like, oh, my world is so different than Katrina's. Um, so I totally felt that too uh, throughout the story. Um, it catches you off guard, but it's so powerful when it happens. I think just, let me just kind of, yeah. it's like that, you know, when you're, when you're queer, when you're trans, life could just be bopping along. You could just be going out buying detergent and suddenly your life falls apart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so there are times in my, in, in my narrative where something just weird just happened, you know, something happens and I'm not trying to shock the reader that that's just the way I perceive reality. Yeah. Yeah. It feels organic. I think in both books, actually, there are moments where I'm like, Oh, that was just the, I, I felt, of course, I don't know as the reader, but it felt like the, the thing happened on the page in the words and in the sentences. That's a yeah. high compliment. Thank you. <laughs> wow. um, and I love it when books surprise me. Um, this kind of is related to that. Uh, it's about writing across genres. Um, so we've talked about how, you know, there is uh, in Light from Uncommon Stars, both demons and starships <laughs> and an imperial galactic empire. And then like a very, you know, familiar, I guess, to certain people, LA landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and then in No Gods, No Monsters, you've got the Caribbean monsters, um, you've got police brutality, you have Boston, you have academia, um, and cooperatives. Uh, so lots of stuff going on in the story. And you know, I would say that they do span across different genres. Um, so I was just curious about crafting that book that draws from these different traditions. You've, you've talked about it a little bit, but anything more you want to say there and was this a worry for you at all in the drafting and even now as you're approaching having the books come out yeah uh rico maybe we'll start with you this time well when, when this book was starting up i mean um it was i was writing this book and um 
I had just was thinking what I'm what was I going to do after Himalaya Hilo, my first novel. Um, and it was all being very, very traditional, but gradually my life kind of fell apart. I mean, I, uh, you know, had a horrible breakup and uh, I lost a, I'm an adjunct, so I lost a class and I was uh, collecting unemployment for the first time in my life and my car got stolen. And, you know, just, you know, these things were kind of happening and my work just, I started to hold on to my story because the writing was the mm -hmm. only thing that um, that I had that I really count on. Um, you know, um, yeah, we can just go on. My mother got sick. You know, she, you know lots of things happened. Yeah. Um, but the funny thing about when you hold on to something, it uh, it starts to take the shape of your hand, and your hand's not a regular thing. It, your fingerprints get in there, and mm -hmm. it becomes very individual, and it starts to not have a, a predictable shape and, and but i just kept honing it and honing it and um and it got and and at this point i was thinking to myself and this isn't really touchy feely but i was just thinking well if i'm going to be damned if i do and damned if i don't and you know if if my unemployment runs out i'm going to write the best story that i'm going to write and mm -hmm. you know gods and monsters be damned you know um really i'm just going to go go forward and um that was the best move i could have made mm -hmm. because uh, i found a wonderful agent and i found a wonderful press that came to me and said this is a world and this is a journey we want to explore with you and for the first time with my writing i didn't feel i was looking backwards that you know mm -hmm. people we're saying, okay, Rika's going to take us on a trip. We got our shoes. We, we got our hiking boots. You know, we got we got our little blasters. We have our donuts. Let's go. And uh, so that's that's been a gift. But it did come from. And the other thing too, I guess you know, it's like you really feel uh, that when you're in a situation like that, that you got very very little because even like with my parents. Um, they're not particularly accepting of my uh, my choices in life, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes you just feel that, or I would just feel that writing was the only thing I had. And so um, the weird thing about writing is when you give it everything, it gives you everything. Mm -hmm. So wow. so that's kind of where I was with that. And, um, you know, just uh, for those listening, things are better now. So thank you. Oh, wow, I love that. I love, and, I love all your words. Yeah. Yeah. Cadwell, how about for yourself? Oh, uh, um, yeah. I, I mean, I'll answer the, the second part first. I, I didn't, I tried not to think about what genres I was crossing. Um, I, I knew I had an opportunity. Um, the, you know, the lesson came out, people seemed to like it. So I knew with the second book, I was going to just, follow, follow my heart, follow everything, you know, that I, you know, my, my greatest dreams for the project. And so I pulled, I pulled from everywhere. I didn't hold back. Um, you know, is, you know, there's part of, there's part of the book that, you know, explores quantum mechanics. I was like, yes, I'll put that in, you know, there's gods in it. There's like a, like, you know, um, sort of a spoiler, a little cat God that shows up. Um, <laughs> you know, why not? You know, um, you know, there's, you know, you know, multiverse and, and 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 vampires and all of those things were you know are things that I just love and I you know get excited about as a reader and so and you know I think about constantly when I'm just you know sitting and so it was it was the opportunity to just like take all of this stuff that I that I love and have them live together and see how they would how they would play together mm -hmm. and I also um, you know, um, as I said, very excited about, very interested in solidarity economics and you know communities using um, using their resources and pooling resources to kind of create stability for themselves. And you know, it's a passion of mine, so I wanted to bring that into the book. You know, I you know I have a lot of characters dealing with you know trauma that um, you know, so I, I pulled a lot from my from my own childhood, my own life, my own relationship with my um, my father. And, um, you know, it was just, it was just a, you know, I think a good opportunity to just take all the things that I, I love, all the things that I struggle with and make 
the book that is the sum of all of that. And I and I tried it, you know. Um, I think afterwards is when I started getting nervous. You know, when I you know when I was reading back through it, I was like, this is weird. This is all over the place. I wonder if people are gonna you know how people are gonna receive it. You know, and you know, luckily, so far it seems to be all right. It seems to be that people are along for the ride, and you know, I you know I've been appreciating that. People can be really generous. Wow. Yeah, I I feel like you know, one would hope, and I think it, it it often pans out that when you pour all that love and true feeling into something that there it does meet its audience, or at least that's what we can all hope for as writers. Um, right. I know we don't have a ton of time left, which frustrates me because I'm really learning so much from both of you. I did want to make sure I hit on an advice question, which is um, the way I like to phrase it if people are, are also teachers is, you know, what is a piece of advice that you think has resonated a lot with your students or that has helped a lot of students um, having to do with their writing life broadly? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, Cad, we'll start with you. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, I, I just started teaching um, last year during the pandemic. So, you know, the imposter syndrome has been real. So, you know, the way that I've helped myself through that is to not come into the room and speak from the you know position of authority on anything. I, I have a lot of subjective you know um, comments for the work itself. You know, but the thing that I think that I I try to you know express to students, and it, you know, is the thing that I've been learning is you know you know patience and patience with yourself as an artist doing this work, and also um, trusting yourself. You know, um, doing the thing that you want to do, and. And even if it's a thing that you know isn't conventional, and the, you know, um, I think oftentimes I, I I've had both experiences where with professors that were very you know didactic, and they were like, "This is how this should work," you know, you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. And then I've also had you know professors that have been really encouraging about taking things wherever they go, and you know, taking risks. And um, I try to just encourage empathy. With, with my students, you know, empathize with each other and, you know, where a particular person is trying to go with their story and help them in that direction. And, you know, um, you know, empathize with themselves, give themselves room to, you know, sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes you need more time, sometimes you need to put something down. And, you know, that kind of like, you know, grace is the thing that I try to impart. Yeah. I think for, that was really well said, Cadwell, thank you. I just wanted to add something else to that too, is when I'm teaching, telling students, never be afraid to ask, how do, why do I need to do this? How am I going to use this? I mm -hmm. think that sometimes, uh, instead of being didactic, a student can always, should be able, and any teacher should be able to explain to a student why this might be needed for them. And, you know, we, we're bombarded with so much information, we really can't take things because just because we can't do that anymore. So whether it's like using the MLA format and saying that, you know, yeah. you might need to be able to adhere to a format for a certain thing. This might help you write a sonnet, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of these feelings where, you know, you, it, your education, at least higher education is all for you. I'm not paying the tuition. You can ask and make this education useful to you for now. This is a tool, and the tool will serve you. It won't serve the institution. It doesn't have to. Don't be afraid to ask why. Love that. And asking why for anything. Um, thank you both so much for the insights uh, and the fun conversation. I now have two donuts to try. Um, and. <laughs> You know, I definitely would encourage all of our viewers to purchase the author books from our bookseller partners at the link below. These are the covers. Also and then beautiful. that one too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and please also consider supporting San Diego Council on Literacy. Again, the link is um, flashing on the screen right now. And um, you can continue to join us for a full program of author panels. Um, live entertainment streamed online, and all videos will be available at SFD Fest, SD Festival of Books uh, So thank you again, uh, thank Carlos, you, Rika. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Thank us. you, Isabel, and everybody have a great festival. Yeah.
Bye, buddy. <laughs>